scripture lesson for today is found in John 6, verses 51 to 58. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to reading and research about food. And it sort of started a couple of years ago when Adam and I were thinking about starting a family. We had decided that we wanted to get healthy, to have healthy bodies, uh, particularly me, to, to sort of pass on to our child. So we did what um, people who are only sort of researching do, which is we watch some documentaries, right? Uh, we watch television. That's a great thing to do. Um, and we decided in the end, after watching, you know, uh, documentary after documentary, that we were going to stop eating meat. Or at least, uh, for us, it made sense that we were going to stop eating meat that wasn't raised locally, without hormones, on a free-range farm, or that was butchered humanely. Those are sort of our criteria. Basically, we decided uh, that Minute Maid was right, that their campaign was right. Uh, that if you put good in, you'll get good out. You guys ever seen those commercials? Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Along this journey to eat as much fresh and as much from scratch as possible, I've been confronted over and over again by the complex realities of food. For instance, when you try to eat fresh, it becomes apparent quickly that fresh vegetables are more expensive than processed food. Processed foods are also um, much less prone to spoilage and therefore waste. Processed foods are not only more convenient to buy, but for untrained cooks in small kitchens with little kitchen utensils, they're easier all around. When I was in Nashville, we were confronted with the pervasiveness of food deserts. Is that a phrase you all know? Food desert? Yeah? Good. Well, for those of you who don't know, the, a food desert is a large part of the country <coughs> that's devoid of fresh fruit, vegetables, and other healthy whole foods. And usually these deserts occur in low-income or impoverished areas. <coughs> that means that those who also lack uh, easy access to health care and shelter are very likely uh, lacking good grocery stores, farmers markets, or healthy food providers in general. So, the healthier I try to eat, a person with disposable income, the more the truth is revealed to me, which is that eating healthy in this country is for the wealthy. Or it is at least most accessible to middle and upper middle classes as a mark of status. Conversely, this means that those whose income are bring around or are below the poverty level are often left with food that is innutritious or in the worst of cases are left without food at all. Now see, I have the great privilege of having an actual box for a soapbox. You guys cage me up here, don't you? Uh, no, but I want to step on a soapbox for a minute and say that uh, 
when I was doing some reading in preparation for this sermon, I read website after website that suggested low-income families can afford a healthy diet if only they would try harder. This is a false perception. And it's one that breaks my heart. Because this false perception comes from a wounded and broken world that also tells us what we need most consume is the latest fashions, the largest entertainment packages, as much fast food as we want whenever we want it, bigger and better houses, anything to boost our perceived status and of course retail sales. And in reality, none of this is true. What is true is that low-income families are often stuck in a vicious cycle of poverty that takes away any agency they have in deciding choice concerning the most basic of needs. What is true for those of us who have enough food is that we don't need anything more than that, which in the end will leave us empty. What is true is that we need to nourish body and soul with Jesus. We must be intimately acquainted with God's words, God's actions, God's promises, and God's love. We must dwell in God's house, be a part of God's body as the body of Christ, and we must see as Christians who consume the Eucharist that we are what we eat, and that what we eat at the Lord's table is not limited to our spiritual nourishment. What happens in the moment of communion has both immediate and infinite implications, not just for our souls, but for our bodies. In fact, I believe there is no separation between the body and the soul. They are intertwined. They work together. They are blessed together. They were created together. In God's image, body and soul together make up our totality. And together they speak of the Christ recorded in the Gospel of John. In today's excerpt, John's Jesus uses deeply provocative language about his own body. He says blatantly that those who follow him will eat his flesh and drink his blood. There's no sort of euphemism about bread and cup. It is flesh and blood. He says that there is something about his body that is also eternal. And he doesn't just use this like, weird and offensive language once. He uses it five times in this short excerpt. Now perhaps this language, like the, like the verse, uh, verse 53 where he says, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now perhaps language like that doesn't shock you. After all, we gather around these words pretty regularly. Anytime we take communion, you hear the words, Take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this is the blood of the new covenant. But it must have shocked those who are following Jesus, because if you keep reading on in the Gospel of John after this, the crowds who had been following him up to this point began to dissipate. People start leaving. This talk about gulping blood and swallowing flesh turned people off. And it can have the same effect today. It's a strange act to reconcile with our modern sensibilities. For folks with no background in the church, how do we begin to explain this practice and the language around it? I heard a, <coughs> I heard a story from a UCC pastor I saw at a conference once named Martin Copenhaver who said that <coughs> once he was offering the elements to his congregation, it's a very serious moment in front of the Lord's table, he got to the moment of institution and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he heard from a child who was in the congregation for the first time say, Oh God, we don't have to eat that, do we? <laughs> it's a strange thing we do. And it's one of those things that makes Christianity seem barbaric 
maybe even violent, and most certainly irrelevant. So if this language has the ability to stir the pot across all of time, I have to ask myself, what are some reasons Jesus may have used this language? Why would John record it this way? Now there are surely many reasons, but I think the one we have most need to hold on to is this. Jesus talks about his own body in such graphic ways so that we may never be given the chance to spiritualize away the importance of our bodies or the absolute necessity eating and drinking has for life. Jesus must have known that we would be prone to separating our spirits away from our bodies. He must have known that somewhere along the way when we reflect on the Sermon on the Mount, we would stop reading it like Luke, who said, Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are those who, hungry, who are hungry now, for you will be filled. And that we would start reading it like Matthew, whose version of the Sermon on the Mount says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus must have known that one day we would gather around a table with bread and cup, that we would bless it in his name without ever mentioning the 6.8 million households across this country that they call, uh, that, what, that have what they call low food security, which means they aren't sure if there will be dinner or not. Or that we would claim as the United Methodist Church that we have open hearts, open minds and open doors without being willing to walk through them ourselves to deliver a meal to the 8% of seniors who go hungry in West Virginia every day or the staggering 21% of children who don't know if there will be food at home when they get off the school bus. In John, Jesus says he is the living bread. And then he goes on to say that he abides in us. To me, this means that the promises of Jesus are not me merely about the life that occurs after death, but about life right now. To me, it means that those who claim Christ must also be willing to meet him in our hungry neighbor. Jesus did not want us to be concerned with souls and not with bodies. His message here seems to indicate that what we do for the health of a body is directly connected to the health of the soul. Take, eat. These last couple of days I've been with my residency group. It's a requirement for ordination. Um, and so over a three year period, I meet uh, with a group of peers who are all in the same uh, same part of the ordination process as I am and we meet for covenant groups and education and we do this overnight six times a year for three years. And at the November meeting in my first year I was greatly pregnant. I was a month from my due date and uh, so I walked around like this all the time. Avoiding uh, close close uh, parking spaces and whatever because I couldn't get out of my car. So I was greatly pregnant. And I was gathered with this group as we always do for worship and for communion on the first night. And when it came time to partake in the meal, I walked, well, I waddled, right? I <laughs> waddled. I waddled to the table with the rest of my colleagues. You know, I held out my empty hands. I received bread. I took it, I dipped it into the cup, I chewed, I swallowed the body of Christ, and on my way back to my seat, Alder began to kick furiously, <laughs> as if she knew that something important were happening, right? And so I nudged, I nudged one of my colleagues named Cindy, and I said, Cindy, feel Alder's kicking after receiving communion. <laughs> And uh, to the best of my mind, Cindy said something like this. She said, we don't think very much about the body and blood of Christ being actual food that actually nourishes. Right now, Alder is being fed and formed by the Lord's Supper. And I thought about that and how profound that was. And, and those words were still ringing in my ear 
when our group leader who had been presiding over communion, she spread out her hands like this, right? Have all been fed. And we were a little confused because it's a small group and she knew that all of us had, had gone up and that, that everyone had received communion. So she, she kept, we sort of were looking around at each other, but she kept still. And she said it again. Have all been fed. Go forth and feed the world. I felt in that moment God break into the world. And I felt that ours, this group of gathered ministers, that ours was not only the work of helping souls, but of also doing this eternal work of feeding others. I had been fed. My daughter had been fed. I had been commissioned to feed, and I prayed that Alder would have a heart for feeding others. While this passage in John does not describe a Eucharist ritual, and we know that because it doesn't match any of the other Eucharist uh, establishments in any of the other Gospels, it does describe something important about our moment at the table. It describes the need for our eternal promise, which is that we will abide in God as God abides in us that our eternal promise will make its way into this temporal place. If we are going to claim an everlasting relationship with the living bread, we must be committed to the ways in which the eternal can break into the everyday. So for me, far from this language disconnecting us from our modern sensibilities, it has very little literal implications for us. As people who live in West Virginia, which is the, uh, the 13th most impoverished state when it comes to food security, the second state in statistics of obesity, and the fourth state in statistics about, in statistics about alcoholism, and we are ever-growing the meth capital of the world. This language, take, eat, take, drink, this is not barbaric, it's not violent, and it's certainly not irrelevant. We are still concerned with health and wholeness. In plain terms, it's about feeding each other. Literally, we must give each other life with healthy, nutritious food and good, clean drink. We must share what we have with those who have none, and we must do this without spiritualizing the need. What the soul needs first and most is that care be given to the body. It's true that we do not live on bread alone. It is also true that we do not live very long without it. So take the meal today. Take it and remember that not all feast as we do. Take it and remember that you are what you eat and then ask yourself, have all have all been fed. Amen.